Hi, my name is Professor Hammond. I will be giving you a brief pre-lab um, pre lecture about boiling points, in particular to prepare us for our distillation lab. First, the concept of how does a liquid boil. All liquids work the same way, is that every liquid gives off vapor pressure. And the vapor pressure of a given liquid depends on the temperature. So vapor pressure is proportional to temperature for every single liquid. When a liquid's vapor pressure equals the air pressure that's pushing back, so we're just going to abbreviate this AP, so air pushes back down, vapor pressure is coming out of the liquid. When the two are equal, that is the definition of a boiling point. So any liquid will boil once its vapor pressure equals that of its surrounding air pressure. This is why boiling points never stay the same in different parts of the country. For example, if you were to take this pot and you want to boil water on top of Mount Charleston, the air pressure is so low that the water boils around 60 degrees. At around 60 degrees or lower, that's barely warm enough to even heat up uh, noodles and macaroni. Conversely, if you come down to Las Vegas, we have a higher air pressure. Pure water in Las Vegas boils around 97, 98 degrees because it takes more vapor pressure to equal that air pressure. Um, now, what happens when you add impurities? So, we're going to throw in some impurities into our liquid. Whenever impurities are added, sorry, this marker is not writing very well. Impurities always, there's no exception on this, drop the vapor pressure of a liquid. In other words, some of this vapor pressure is no longer pushing up. And when that happens, the liquid cannot boil at the same temperature it did before. What happens is, is the boiling point, and this is another law, whenever impurity is added, boiling points of a liquid always increase. Or to say it differently, the liquid has to reach a higher temperature before it can reach the pressure of the air pressure and boil against it. That's an absolute truth. Now this law is called Rayleigh's law. And Rayleigh's law basically says that the pressure of a liquid that is seen is equal to the pressure when it's pure, the circle means pure, times how pure it is. It's called the mole fraction. So, as soon as a liquid becomes less pure, its mole fraction drops, therefore its pressure observed drops from when it's pure. Um, this actually con is a, um, contradicts an old wives' tale. People have told me you dump salt into a pot of water to make it boil faster. I guarantee salt will never, ever boil water faster. In fact, I can guarantee it will actually make it boil slower. Because the salt will make the water more impure. It will take longer or have to reach a higher temperature. Now, the advantage of adding salt to water is that when the water finally does boil, it will be hotter. And you can actually use that advantage if you're up on top of Mount Charleston. You add enough impurities like salt, the water's temperature will be hot enough to actually cook something. Okay, so Reyes Law is all about this, about the impurity factor on a boiling point. Remember, uh, or sorry, on vapor pressure. Remember, boiling point doesn't change. Vapor pressure still has to reach air pressure or the liquid cannot boil. Now, in today's lab, we're going to deal with a mixture of two liquids. So, I'm going to diagram a new setup and have a little room left, still on camera, 
So we're going to set in a round bottom flask and we're going to add two separate liquids in here. We're going to do some water and some acetone. Okay. Rael's law is still applying to this mixture, but it actually applies to both liquids separately. Um, so in a container like this, where we have a mixture of liquids, the vapor pressure of the total solution that's coming off will be equal to the vapor pressure of one of the liquids. We'll call that, we can call that one water, because that's what we're doing today, plus the vapor pressure of the second liquid, which today is going to be acetone, so we'll call that A. So up here, let's draw a little circle line, and now let's put some dots up here above the liquid to represent the molecules that have gone into the vapor stage. So we have a liquid stage and we have a vapor stage. If the two liquids had identical boiling points and identical effects, then their vapor pressures would be the same. However, in today's lab, the boiling point of water, when it's pure, is around 100 degrees at sea level's um, atmospheric pressure. And the boiling point of acetone is, I wrote it down, I think it's 56. Let's just double check. Yep, it's 56 degrees at the temperature at sea level. So when acetone is pure, its boiling point is 56. When water is pure, its boiling point is 100, again, at atmospheric pressure. But in the mixture, the component with the lower boiling point, if they're 50-50, will have much more vapor than the component that has the higher boiling point. So the vapor ratio is no longer 50-50. So what happens to a boiling point then? So we're going to first do a simple distillation. And when you do a simple distillation, and I'll show you the apparatus right now. But the pot will have a mixture, the vapors will reach. We'll have the thermometer set right where the vapors change and go down the condenser. And we're going to measure the temperature of those vapors as they go across and down the condenser. So I'm going to do a pretend graph now on the board above this short path distillation. If, and this is just an approximate, you guys will have the opportunity to do a real life graph. So I'm going to start at 50 and I'm going to go to 100. And we're going to start with a 50-50 mixture of the two components. Now if we had pure acetone, so let's make it pure acetone, 100% acetone here. And then at this side, we'll switch colors, we'll make it 100% water at this side. At 100% pure acetone, the, um, I need some approximate bars, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, yeah, we'll go about there, 60, 70, 80, 90. So pure acetone has a boiling point at about 56 degrees. Water has a boiling point at about 100 degrees. And I'm going to put those two dots up there. Hopefully we can see them. When we have mixtures, the boiling point always lands somewhere between these two dots, depending on the curve. So I'm going to draw an approximate curve. It's not a perfect curve, but it'll give us an idea. You're going to measure this exactly. Okay, so what happens now, the liquid mixture will have a boiling point that's higher than the acetone's boiling point, but lower than the water's boiling point. Okay, 
here's the interesting thing. As the vapors come off, the majority of the vapors coming off, well, they're no longer 50-50. We already mentioned that. Because the lower uh, boiling point, he's coming off with a greater amount of vapor. In a little while, the liquid will no longer be 50-50. It might be, let's say, 75% water and only 25% acetone. What happens to the boiling point now when the mixture has changed concentration? Well, the boiling point of the liquid is now at a higher temperature because there is more water, or to say it a little differently, the fraction that is water is higher, so the water is contributing more to the vapor pressure of himself, whereas the fraction of acetone is lower, he's contributing to a lower vapor pressure himself, and the boiling point still is the same. So when these two boiling points and the vapor pressure equals the air pressure. So, consequently, we should notice that after a little while, the temperature is going to have to be hotter in order to boil the liquids because the liquid has changed ratio. And this will gradually increase and increase as we go through this chart. So, we will see something like this. This is called, and I'm going to label this curve right here. This is the liquid's boiling point based on the ratio of moles of the two different liquids, or the mole fraction of two liquids. All right. So that's part one of the lab. Now part two, we're going to do something special. It's called adding a fractionating column. I'm going to demonstrate that for a moment, and then I'm going to show you. We're going to add this piece of glassware that has all these glass beads in between. It's hard to do this one. In between the round bottom flask and the condenser that's on top. Okay, so what is the purpose of adding this extra column with all these beads. Well, this is called a fractionating column. The idea is, is in a fractionating column that's out of the flask, so let me just hold these two parts, and you guys can pretend the condenser is on out, is that the vapor comes out boiling at whatever its boiling point is. It has a chance to recondense into droplets on the surface of these glass beads. Okay, so I'm going to hold this a little closer. And when it recondenses, it'll create a new mixture of the liquids. Let's talk about that new mixture of those liquids. Will that new mixture of liquids still be at a 50-50 ratio? Well, if we look at this diagram here, you'll see, well, no. I have more acetone vapor than I do water vapor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line going backwards, the vapor ratio might be at a 70-30 or uh, say a 75-25 or a 35-65. Uh, Let's just pretend it's 35-65. Okay, so the, even though the liquid boiled here, this is the vapor. I gotta make it higher. The vapor ratio uh, is not the same. It has more acid than the other. And so what happens is, if we give the chance for that vapor to recondense into droplets, it'll drop back down and that mixture will have a new boiling point, which just happens to be lower than the boiling point of the original mix mixture. Okay. If the heat coming up from the vapor from down here hits this liquid, it will then be enough energy to boil it. And because it's at a lower boiling point, it will change again. So this liquid boils. It has more acetone in it. So let's say this was, what did I say? Uh, 6535. So now there's even more acetone vapor because there's more liquid and there's less water vapor. And this one will now 
create a vapor that has even more acetone in it. So this time, let's say now it's at about 80-20. Okay. What would happen if that liquid condenses? Well, if that liquid condenses, that liquid, or I should say when those vapors condense, that liquid will now have an even lower boiling point. And you can see that if you give it enough chances to make a new set of vapor, recondense, new set of vapor, recondense, in time, you should be able to end up with nearly pure acetone. So let's look at this column again. So every time vapor recondenses, then reboils and recondenses and reboils, we call that a fractionating plate. And if we do it enough times, as I shown on the graph, we should eventually end up with only the vapor of the lowest boiling point substance coming off and going down the condenser. At least that's the goal when we do a fractionating distillation, is to separate out the one. Okay, now let's move further up the chart. So, we're boiling up the fractionating column, the pure acetone's coming out, and before long, what's left in the beaker at the bottom, so, let's use our imagination again. We're separating, we're fractionating, fractionating, the acetone's coming down the condenser, in the beaker, there's going to be higher water concentration and less acetone. Therefore, down inside the beaker, we will have, eventually, we'll get to a 75-25 point. Well, even though it's 75% water and 25% acetone, acetone will still create more vapor than 25%. It might be 35%. And the water. And that vapor can condense, make a new liquid. And then that liquid can still vaporize at a lower temperature and create a, another concentration and it can condense. And what's interesting is this can happen even up here at nearly 99% pure water. Even at 99% might be 2% acetone in the vapors. And we will get these steps coming down over and over and over. Where the vapor... is more enriched in acetone than the actual liquid that boiled originally. And this curve, I'm going to do it in blue, is called the vapor curve. So the vapor ratio is always to the right in my drawing to the liquid's boiling ratio. And as the vapor recondenses the liquid, its boiling point goes down. In a perfect universe, with enough theoretical plates and a tall enough column, you can eventually just drive out every molecule of acetone out of your round bottom, send it through all of these steps, these theoretical plates, and eventually end up with just the acetone coming off. Once the acetone is finally gone, then we're left with only 100% pure water, and then we should see a sudden increase as the water finally makes it all the way to the top and it comes off. Alright, the first drop has just come off. Record the temperature now as your zero mark. Okay, record the temperature now as your first milliliter. Alright, <clears throat> record the temperature now for your second milliliter.
All right, record the temperature of your third milliliter. Record the temperature of your fourth milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of your fifth milliliter. Record the temperature of your sixth milliliter. Record the temperature of your seventh milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of your eighth milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of your ninth milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of your tenth milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of the eleventh milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of the twelfth milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of the thirteenth milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of the fourteenth milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of the fifteenth milliliter. Record the temperature of the sixteenth milliliter. Record the temperature of the seventeenth milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of the eighteenth milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of the nineteenth milliliter. Okay, and record the temperature of the last one, the twentieth milliliter. Ready, stop. Stop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. We do not see any color gradients. The blue color did not come through on any of the test tubes, even the twentieth one, which is right here. Okay, now we're going to repeat the distillation, except this time we're inserting the fractionating column. The fractionating column is filled with beads where the vapor can recondense and revaporize, recondense and revaporize, thus giving us multiple theoretical plates, and in theory should be able to separate the two vapors of our mixture. Uh, we will boil it, and we will record the temperatures, again, for every milliliter from zero to 15 milliliters. What we'll need to do is wait for the liquid to start boiling. That'll take a couple minutes, which we will fast forward through. Now, you can see that the liquid is now boiling. You should also be able to see droplets of liquid beginning to form in our fractionating column. And what will happen is, is those droplets will drip back in and the vapor ratio will change according to Rayel's law inside the fractioning column. So right now our vapors are in here and they're changing ratios. All right, the first drop has come off. It is time to record your zero milliliters. Record the temperature now. Okay, record the temperature now for the first milliliter. Okay, record the temperature for your second milliliter. Okay, record the temperature for your third milliliter. Right, record the temperature of your fourth milliliter. Okay, record your temperature of your fifth milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of your sixth milliliter. Record the temperature of your seventh milliliter. Record the temperature of your 8th milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of the 9th milliliter. Record the temperature of the 10th milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of your 11th milliliter. 
So the temperature your 12 milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of your 13th milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of your 14th milliliter. Okay, record the temperature of your 15th and final milliliter. Now that you've recorded these temperatures, you should be able to plot both sets of data from 0 to 15 milliliters on one graph. Make sure you plot it by hand.